Hello, I'm George Hartwell, Mayor of the City of Grand Rapids, and it's my great honor and pleasure tonight uh, to, uh, to interview and to introduce to you uh, Prince Sedza Dlamini. Sedza Dlamini uh, of South Africa, uh, who is the founder of the uh, Ubuntu uh, Institute for Social Entrepreneurs and serves as its, uh, as its uh, uh, CEO now. Uh, he is also the co-chair of the World Youth Peace Summit uh, and serves on the strategic development team of the Global Action Youth Network. Uh, a, a truly remarkable man, and I don't want to take too much of time doing this, but I want to read you one statement out of uh, his biography. Uh, Sedza's vision is to create a unified global order by establishing global networks of empowered young leaders who can work collectively to address current world problems such as HIV AIDS, poverty and hunger, environmental decay, and illiteracy. Uh, this is truly, uh, while he's a man of South Africa, he's a man of the globe, and we're looking forward to this conversation uh, tonight. Uh, uh, Prince Lamini, welcome to Grand Rapids. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be here, and thanks for your time, and uh, really such a pleasure to be in the Midwest. Uh, it's my first time uh, in, in Michigan. Uh, and certainly the Grand Rapids area. So this is a historic, uh, uh, you know, a visit for me here, and I'm, I'm looking uh, forward to spending a few days here. Wonderful. Well, we we're certainly honored to have you here, and uh, and I know we're looking forward to your remarks uh, later this evening yes. uh, as you'll be addressing yes. uh, an audience here in Grand Rapids. Mm -hmm. um, you you, uh, you are, are are indeed a uh, a leader in your own right. Mm. But there's one thing I left out of your biography that I'd like to talk about briefly, sure. and that is that you are the grandson of Nelson Mandela. Yes. Uh, and, and I'd like to, uh, I, I mentioned to you before we started today that I was uh, one of the uh, international elections monitors uh, in South Africa in the, uh, in the elections that brought an end to apartheid and brought your grandfather into, uh, into public office as the, uh, as the leader of South Africa. Mm. You were a young man at the time, a teenager. Mm. Uh, mm. Would you reflect a little bit on your memories of that time? Thank you, thank you. Well, um, first of all, uh, you know, uh, coming here, certainly um, I'm wearing a hat, uh, an independent hat, um, uh, outside of the background, family background. And, uh, you know, as, um, as a young man growing up in South Africa, well, I mean, first of all, growing up in Swaziland, because that's really where I, um, uh, I was raised and I grew up most of my life. And just going into South Africa later for university and for, um, you know, to actually work. Um, South Africa, as you know, was right on the verge of a bloodbath. Uh, bloodbath between the blacks, uh, the minority groups, uh, uh, the colored, uh, the Indians, um, and the contestation for power, access to political power and economic power, and uh, all the economic resources really resting amongst a few white South Africans. And um, this was a time of great uncertainty. No one knew what was going to happen. The white people in South Africa didn't know if they let go of um, the, all the resources and the power that they had over the years, if things would be the same after that. Um, some black people didn't know, uh, should we be going into this in a peaceful fashion um, when we've been fighting for so long? There was, you know, part of the struggle was a violent, um, uh, I mean, there was a lot of violence leading up, particularly to 94, as you know, the Zulus in the Deben area, uh, the Ngata Freedom Party, um, trying to get at stake, and this is a period that really no one didn't knew exactly what was going to pan out, and in a great, in a time when there's um, uh, the type of um, uncertain environment that we were in, uh, there really was a need for great leadership, uh, leadership that would take the 
potentially disastrous bloodbath situation that, that would bring hope. Leadership that would bring black, white, Indians, and colors together. Leadership that would uh, essentially create a new future that, um, that had not been seen in South Africa before. So this was a, a period of, uh, of, of, of great uh, um, uh, doubt uh, and, and, and yet at the same time great hope. And this is a period when the HIV AIDS epidemic was sort of slowly creeping in the background. Uh, the Rwanda genocide was happening in um, around about the same time and marking pretty much what many are calling the end of uh, the colonial era on the African continent. And as a young person growing up then, uh, we witnessed uh, a lot of uh, the great leadership that we recognize today, uh, putting aside the leadership of Nelson Mandela, people like Des Desmond, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, that led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I'll be speaking a little bit about that tonight. Well, I'll be speaking a lot about it, because that's part of our miracle is that we uh, were able to take a potentially uh, a bloodbath situation and then created a, a truly a model for the world for conflict resolution and uh, to, to have been part of that legacy to have been to be in that country at that time uh, you just have to pinch yourself to say wow um, this didn't I'm not reading um, history books but it happened whilst we were alive and um, and and so um, yes we're looking back and we're saying, thank God. Uh, not only did we overcome those years, but uh, uh, Madiba is still alive. And, uh, you know, just for that alone, to have Nelson Mandela still alive at 92, 93 is, uh, is the biggest gift that South Africa could have ever imagined. Now we're hosting the World Cup, of yeah. course, next year. So, there you go. yeah. The yeah. World Cup, the World Soccer yeah. Cup yeah. In, yeah. South Africa, in South Africa, in Johannesburg. In Johannesburg, uh, in, in Cape Town yeah. in 2010. It's going to happen in about uh, six of our major provinces with nine provinces so six of the provinces will be hosting some games well two brief memories yeah. uh, I, I was in I was in Johannesburg when uh, Chief Budalese and Nelson Mandela reached their agreement before the election and and what had been a very tense environment uh, uh, even a violent environment mm. uh, suddenly burst into a celebration and people were in the streets in yes. Johannesburg that night and celebrating that these two leaders had found a court and that right. Lazy would indeed be on the ballot. And then, and then on the days of election, uh, 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 talking to people in line, some of the old people of South Africa who, uh, the, uh, and, and the black South Africans who never imagined that they could have uh, cast a vote in their, in their life uh, mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. determine their future, and, mm -hmm. and here they were. It was indeed a miracle. Yeah. Well, that's the past. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about the future. Uh, uh, the Ubuntu... Uh, Institute uh, is is working on the the empowerment of youth. Uh, tell us uh, about the institute and, and your work there. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know we uh, we were we're a three year organization. Um, I was living in Boston. Um, I went to Tufts University and uh, was studying international relations there and then spent some time uh, in New York thereafter. Uh, and I'm, I'm telling you this to introduce how the Ubuntu Institute sort of came about and, and, and its work. And whilst I was in Boston, I got uh, invited to the first ever uh, a global youth leadership summit uh, that was being launched in Dakar in Senegal by the UNDP office and um, and the government of Senegal and that was a pan-african youth leadership conference and it was a life-changing moment life-changing experience for me uh, I had never been to Francophone Africa before and Francophone Africa is very different from Anglophone Africa, from Lusophone Africa, uh, your Portuguese-speaking countries, your Mozambique and your Angolas. And it was a mind-blowing experience, life-changing in that uh, as a participant at this conference, I had not heard of, um, or at least firsthand, interacting with young people from Sudan that were going through conflict, young people from northern parts of Uganda that were going through conflict. Um, other young people from Southern Africa that had first-hand experiences of, you know, HIV-AIDS. Um, 
and some of the environmental issues. And, and that conference was specifically focused on the UN Millennium Development Goals. And we were being brought together to be engaged on the MDGs, as we call them. So it was a life-changing experience because here I was, you know, I was going to school in Boston, and I'm from South Africa and Swaziland, and I was thinking I'll go back into business and most probably, you know, uh, politics and being in the nonprofit sector was not something I was, it was in, in my wildest dreams that I think I would go that direction. So, uh, I was shocked, actually, at the, the rates. You know, one in six people die in South Africa or infected with HIV. Um, um, over, you know, millions of people are living in, in adverse poverty around the world. Um, the issues of gender and women empowerment, um, the illiteracy rates, uh, particularly between men and, and women, and all these issues, the environmental, the global meltdown of our, of our, of our, of our, of our planet, just came right straight to my face. And I said, wow, um, I really have to do something about this. But here's why. Why I wanted to do something about it was because the underlying current of, of all these problems was that one is uh, it's really affecting mostly young people. If you look at the, the, the global statistics over m most countries, particularly the developing countries, they have over 55%, some 60% of young people that are below the age of 35 years old. Many countries in Asia, many countries in Africa. So if you're looking at the face of poverty, the face of gender women issues, the face of uh, poverty, you're really talking it's young, young people. It's a very young face. So the question was, are we then going to wait for elders? Are we going to wait for the previous generation or the next generation to solve this? No, we have to ourselves try and do something. That was then the inspiration that uh, really got me into creating this organization in South Africa. And I realized that you had two types of young people in that um, in that conference, and, and subsequently, I mean, we had other conferences. We were in Hiroshima, Japan, for a Pan Asian conference. Another conference was hosted by President Lula in Brazil. Uh, another European summit uh, was hosted. So this was a series of global summits that all culminated to um, one major summit at the, at the United Nations. And when you've had the privilege of interacting with young people from around the world, two things become clear. The first is that you have a group of young people who are very passionate. They've got leadership skills. They, they, they really want to do something. There's no shortage of ideas, but they don't have access to money or to the resources to do something about it. And then you have another type of young leader, young leader who has access to financial resources, uh, has a good background, but doesn't have the, the skills, the capacity, and they need the, the, the leadership skills to build them and, 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 and to get them um, functional and very effective in what they do. So the one to Institute sort of started with that concept in mind, to say let's identify young people in those both areas to provide support financially to them and then to provide, to provide you know, skills development. So really, we we started off as a youth organization um, providing that, that type of support and we've, we've now evolved because um, I hosted two leadership SADC, Southern African Youth Leadership Summits, bringing together young people from all those 14 countries. And those young people said to us, listen, we have problems but our problems are not as big as the young people that are in the rural. Uh, populations in the outskirts of the cities. So now, this is the core area of the work that we're doing. We're working with a lot of the tribal leaders, the people in those communities where the Millennium Development Goals are really a problem and most of the resources are not getting there. So a lot of our work has evolved into, into those spaces and mm -hmm. um, now we've got funding from the Ford Foundation, um, the Keller Foundation, different donors and um, yeah, so that's uh, what we're doing. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's a, it's a huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was reading um, some material ab about the uh, about the work and yes. and I came upon this uh, vision statement that is uh, uh, appears to be a personal vision statement for you, uh, Prince De Delamini, uh, but is also uh, the the uh, the uh, Ubuntu. Ubuntu yes. uh, Institute's yeah. uh, vision. Yeah. I envision a world with no boundaries, divisions, or uh, illusions of separation. I dream of a world where everyone deeply understands how interconnected we are to each other, such that what you do to others, you do to yourself, and what you fail to do to others, you fail 
to do for yourself. This is not a nation, uh, a world of nations and peoples, but of global citizens. Uh, uh, it's, it's a beautiful statement. Thank you. Uh, and, and a powerful statement. Um, uh, how, how do we move beyond being a world of nations? Mm. Uh, I look at the, I look at the uh, the issue of um, of climate change sure. today, uh, mm. one that I'm deeply involved uh, in, and, mm. and we are here in Grand Rapids, mm. and in, in trying to at, at our little local level bring about solutions. Mm. Um, but 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 nations get locked into um, uh, their their own self interests, sure. and uh, and and will do things that are counterproductive for the rest of the globe. Mm. How do we move beyond being a world of nations? Right. Very good. Uh, I mean, this is a, a very uh, complex uh, phenomenon uh, when you're talking about global citizenship um, and uh, the type of passport that some of us are dreaming of, which is uh, not a, a passport of a nation state but a passport of humanity uh, a passport that says I understand that a young leader could be in Cambodia or in Johannesburg but the same they're facing the same issue uh, and um, uh, I, I think, well, first of all, I mean, I studied international relations. So the concept of nation states, the concept of realist, th realism theory, liberal theory, the formation of the League of Nations, the United Nations, and sort of the, 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 the different versions that are out there of what a global order should look like. And, um, and, 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 and I think when I, when I dreamt of that statement, it really was coming from a position starting off with the individual saying that uh, it won't take the bigger picture, your nations and your countries and all the legislations that take, it really takes, it's about an individual worldview, an individual perspective, starting with myself, that I, I belong first to the planet, to the, to the global community before I'm a Swazi or a South African. And this is what I'll be talking about today, this, 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 this new passport, this new identity um, of being a global citizen. And, and then you've got, you get to practical issues of how one becomes a, a global citizen, um, to really experience what it's like to live a world with no boundaries. I mean, simple things like, um, you know, you, you have, if you look at the statistics, looks like many young people, I do exchange programs between South Africa and, and the US now, and I realize that there's so many young people that don't even have passports, here in the United States in particular. Now, how are you gonna go see the world? How are you gonna travel and see the world if you don't even have a passport to even begin with? If you don't have a passport, you don't even think of going out even to the Caribbean, for example. So it's developing this notion of saying, the world has become smaller, and in becoming small, uh, one has to understand the different dynamics, uh, how a bomb in Kenya or in Tanzania bombing a U.S. embassy can have an impact on you sitting in, in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, or how a global financial crisis happening here can cause the type of ripple effects that it, that is, it has caused. This is, the type, this is a new type of leader, this is a new type of uh, responsibility um, that we have for our generation that requires a personal worldview that's very different from one that defines one into just one community or one country. So it's a complex discussion, but at the epitome of it, it is just uh, at, at an individual level, how you see yourself as a global citizen and your contribution to, to that conversation. No, I, you're, you're reminding me of, a, uh, of a, uh, a, a large billboard that I saw in South Africa mm. during the elections in 94. And, and my recollection is that it was a, a slogan used by the, uh, by the uh, ANC, and, and it said, no one is free until all are free. That's no correct. one is free until all are free. That's correct. And, and, and in the kind of a, uh, an interconnected world that you're describing, uh, the, the, the suffering of, of someone in a, in a, a poor equatorial country uh, or, or South African country or Asian country uh, uh, it needs to be my pain uh, here in the relatively affluent country that we live in. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when I can begin to feel that and understand that at some level, 
then 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 we can begin to address it together. Absolutely, absolutely. And and that's the million dollar question we can pose to the universities. Are they producing those types of leaders? Are, are we producing enough of the next round of global leaders that would have traveled, that would have seen the world, that would really understand that concept? That, that's why I'm here. That's absolutely the reason why I'm here is to is to is to really push for that and 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 then to practically implement things like you know you have sister sister relationships for example sure. those are very important things and uh, you have study abroad programs you have all sorts of things and those are the first questions I'll ask how big is your international student population in this university um, and just going through the GRCC website I didn't see much in terms of African representation of countries where students can go in terms of study abroad um, I heard that Ghana was one of those countries but what about the south what about the east you know and uh, and so on and so forth those are the things that we really need to be putting at the top of our agenda that's th that's what I, I, I think um, the, the Obama administration is somewhat inspired as well around the world, uh, this promise of a new America uh, that brings hope, that really re shows a true representation of what the United States is actually all about. That's gonna take work, it's gonna take work. Indeed. And uh, it doesn't, it, that's not work that happens in a UN level, it happens, you know, just the simplest, pra something as practical as a sister to sister, you know, m m relationship between two sisters, I mean, between two cities. Sure. Yeah. Well, you, you have had the experience, I've had the experience of, of, of traveling abroad. There right. is, uh, especially when you're in a culture that's r radically different from your own, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, uh, I would call it kind of a destabilizing experience. Uh, you're, you're outside of the, the uh, comfort zone mm. that you've created around mm. yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's where learning takes place. That's right. That's where change occurs, that's right. isn't it? That, absolutely. And and, and that's exactly what you're encouraging. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and you, you you won't um, you won't get it until you really go through that experience. And it's uh, it's an experience that I wish on everyone, on everybody on the planet to you know to go through, particularly here in the in the United States. And when I was here, um, when I was in Boston, I was here during the eight years of the Bush presidency. And. Uh, and left just shortly, you know, after um, he, just shortly before he, he was to leave office. And I remember we used to talk about the question of how much he had personally traveled as a president uh -huh. coming into office. Um, so that question I've, I've expanded into asking sure. how many Americans have passports? How many Americans have been outside? And, and, and that's a question to pose to Asia. It's the same question to pose to Africa. When we're living in a world where it's possible to do that, it's possible to travel. Now, um, now at the same time that you're working on, on these large global issues, as, as I look at the materials that I've uh, been able to find uh, yeah. about you and your work, um, you're also deeply engaged in community development at the local level, working with organizations and, and, and especially youth organizations yes. at, the, at the local level. D draw the line between those for me, uh, working at the local level and solving global problems. Right, right, very good. Okay, so we have uh, a variety of uh, programs that we're working on, um, largely driven by our donors uh, that we have partnerships with, for example, the Ford Foundation. Um, and we've received some grants to do a lot of work around um, women empowerment, gender and women empowerment, where we're empowering female tribal leaders. Um, we are doing work around HIV AIDS education, uh, particularly for the girl child, um, HIV AIDS is, the face of HIV AIDS is not only young, but is largely female, if you look at the statistics, uh, especially between 15 and, and 29 uh, year old girls. We have um, poverty eradication programs, and that means we have to roll up our sleeves and we go into those communities to work with those indigenous leaders. Uh, now, how do we bring the global picture, how do we bring in the global community into that conversation? Uh, one way that we're doing it is through our exchange programs, we are bringing together uh, a group of young, Americans from different universities across the United States to Southern Africa, to both South Africa and to Swaziland, where we would be introducing them to 
to projects, community development projects, where they would go in and volunteer some of their time. Well, it's not 100% volunteering. It's volunteering because they don't get paid uh, for what they do, but they, it's, part of their, it's part of their service learning. It's part of they, they, they earn credit from the university for doing that work. So this is how we're building a better world, is to get these students and, in some cases, university professors coming in to work with us in those communities, and they get exposed, and it becomes part of the curriculum here in the United States, and we facilitate those. So uh, I think that's just one really practical example sure. uh, of how we're able to bring the international community into local dynamics. Sure. Yeah. I had the opportunity to spend some time in uh, uh, in uh, New Zealand last December, uh, visiting uh, with uh, governmental leaders and, uh, mm. and and local NGO leadership in that country that are working on on uh, on climate uh, change mm. issues and, mm. and on global warming and mm. Mm. Uh, sustainability in that country, and and, and they have uh, they have targeted. Uh, universities across uh, acro around the from around the world uh, from from every continent to bring students to New Zealand uh, for the experience of working at the at the very most basic levels of community sure. uh, they're 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 planting trees they're working with uh, NGOs uh, uh, in in New Zealand to to, to uh, uh, bring about change there and then of course they take those experiences and that learning back with them wow. when they go to their country. Wow. Well, we've we're, we're, we have five minutes left, oh. and uh, and I want to uh, I want you to l to look ahead now, uh, 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 ten years into the future. Uh, um, I'll be seventy years old. Uh, uh, you'll, <laughs> be, be you'll be you'll be forty three <laughs> years old. Uh, um, if 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 the vision that you're working on continues to manifest and grow, uh -huh. uh, what might our world look like uh, ten years from today? Hmm. What would be your vision of the world 10 years okay. from now? Well, it has to start, that, that vision would have to start at a personal level. Uh, I am hoping that I will end up within the United Nations system somehow, at some point. And um, I, I would love to become the UN Secretary General <laughs> one day. And as you know, it rotates from Africa to Asia and to different um, uh, continents. Um, uh, I would love that um, when, um, when the opportunity for Africa comes around, um, that I, I could be available to submit my resume uh, for that job. Uh, simply because of the international platform that that institution provides and at a practical level to be doing so many different things. And I think uh, things are looking very bleak in, in, many, in many ways. If you're talking about the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, for example, the targets are that by 2015, we need to have poverty. By 2015, we need to solve illiteracy issues. By 2015, we need to have maternity health and uh, environmental issues. We have Copenhagen coming up at the end of the year. Uh, it's looking bleak, it really is. And it's going to require uh, such a huge and drastic change. It, bleak as it looks, though, you couldn't do the work you're doing without hope. Right, right. A and, right, uh, right, right. And, and what I what I hear, when I, what I see radiating from you is mm. a sense of hopefulness. And, that's right. And, and optimism. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, it, it, it has to be a practical optimism. And I think, um, you know, one um, can either look at the class as being half empty or half full. Uh, even speaking about the MDGs, one could say you have many people that think the MDGs are doomed, they're, they're not going to be achieved, um, but we're out there advocating for making sure that those goals are actually achieved and that we actually do something about it and that the, the, the UN MDGs are merely just a framework for what needs to be done. Um, and it's really homework for all of us to make a contribution to, to, to making that happen. 
and I don't believe in the concept that it's going to be other people out there or other organizations out there, but it's about what we can do at an individual level first and walk the talk. And despite the bleak future or the bleak uh, perspective, I still say the glass is half full. Ah. And that's a, that's a beautiful place to stop our conversation, yes. <laughs> although I think I could go on uh, for another two <laughs> hours you, with you. You, you, so uh, you do indeed exude hopefulness and, and optimism, and I, I look forward to the kind of leadership that you'll continue to, uh, to offer to, to the world, uh, indeed. Uh, uh, Prince you. Lamini, uh, thank you so much for being with us here in Grand Rapids. Thank you. I've been interviewing uh, Prince Sidza Dlamini uh, of the Ubuntu uh, Institute, uh, who's here in Grand Rapids uh, speaking to us and bringing his words of hope and encouragement. Uh, Prince, thank you thank very much. Thank you very much, much Mayor. Mayor, I don't thank you so much. All really, right. really appreciate right. it indeed.